So now we are going to listen to Maria. And Maria is a PhD student at the University College of London. And she's going to talk about the uh, efficient detecting of NN splittings. So Maria, I think you can start. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. So I'll be talking about detecting NN splittings. Uh, and this is based on joint work with Craig Costello and Sam Frankly. Uh, the paper will be out soon. Um, but yeah, so we started working on this problem a couple of months ago uh, before all this like stuff. And we took a sort of different, or we have a different application for it where we actually use it to uh, speed up the uh, attack against the dimension two isogeny problem. So, to introduce that, I'll first talk about abelian surfaces. I give a brief recap, uh, then talk about the isogeny problem in two dimensions, introduce the graph, um, and then uh, introduce the best attack against it. And then talk about how we can detect NN splittings and how we can apply this to attacking the uh, isogeny problem. Okay. So first, uh, let me introduce abelian surfaces. So to generalize the um, uh, to generalize supersingular elliptic curves um, to higher dimensions, we really want to think about an elliptic curve as a principally polarized abelian variety. And so then when you think about a variety in dimension two, what this gives you is principally polarized abelian surfaces. And to generalize the super singular bit, um, this is very, a lot of equivalent definitions in genus one, but these become distinct when you go to higher dimensions. And actually the correct generalization that you wanna think of is super special. And this is uh, the generalization of the property that the trace of Frobenius is congruent to zero mod uh, P. Um, and if you generalize that, you consider something called the Hassel-Witt matrix. And this will give you some condition on your abelian surface. And that's sort of the generalization that we wanna use. So there are two types of principally polarized abelian surfaces. The first are just products of elliptic curves. And if your abelian surface is super special, then your elliptic curves will be super singular. And then the next one is sort of an indecomposable um, surface, which is given by Jacobians of genus two curves. So as in the genus one case, we just consider them up to FP bar isomorphism. And to do this, we label uh, these classes of um, these isomorphism classes with uh, different invariants. So in the first case, you consider uh, J invariants. And this should really be a set because it doesn't matter which uh, sort of way around you have the E and the E prime. So then for the uh, Jacobians, you label them with uh, igusa klepsch invariants. And this, these live in some projective, some weighted projective space. Um, and so if you wanna consider them in like affine space, you have to normalize them. And that's how you get the, the triples that Thomas was uh, talking about on Wednesday. Um, and the subscript uh, denotes the weight uh, of them in weighted projective space. But yeah, we can use these invariants to label um, our uh, Jacobians. Oh. And then for super special uh, abelian surfaces, these invariants will lie in FP squared, very similar to the case in genus one where all your J invariants will lie in FP squared. Okay, so then an N and isogeny is just an isogeny from two from an abelian surface to another or a principally polarized abelian surface a to a prime where your kernel is given by two copies of z mod nz and your isogeny respects the polarization and this um, condition you sort of um, ensure that this happens if um, 
the generators of your kernel, say P and Q, um, have veil pairing equal to one. So this is a maximal isotropic subgroup. And that ensures that your isogeny will respect the polarization. So then in its most general form, the um, isogeny problem in genus two asks you to find an isogeny between an abelian surface A to A prime, uh, where they're defined over FP squared. Um, and like in genus one, you can view this problem as sort of a pathfinding problem in the super special graph where our A's will be nodes on the graph and then the edges will be N and isogenies between them. And so if you find a path in this graph, you've found an isogeny between them. So um, what is this graph for, uh, so let P be a large prime and then us, P doesn't divide N, then the NN isogeny graph um, will be a graph with vertex at SP, where um, these are the isomorphism classes of super special abelian, principally polarized abelian surfaces. And then the edges will be NN isogenies. So these, this has some nice properties. Firstly, the vertex set is finite, and this is a uh, one of the reasons why super speciality is the right generalization is that you actually get a finite vertex set. The classes, so the isomorphism classes, um, can be represented by surfaces defined over FP squared, uh, which is also nice. So you don't have to work in extension fields. And the graph is regular where uh, is dn regular where dn is given by this formula in particular when n is prime it's just n squared plus one times n plus one um uh unfortunately there's no sort of analogy of Pfizer's theorem uh, or hasn't been proven so this basically tells you that the su super singular isogeny graph is a uh, ramanujan and so a lot of primitives that are built in genus two often just assume that it is, but there's no proof of it. So because we have two types of abelian surfaces, we can split up the graph in two different subsets. So the first is just the set where your surface is isomorphic to the Jacobian of a, a genus two curve. And this EP is just the set where you have products of elliptic curves. And what this tells you is that your graph actually can be split into two disjoint subsets where the white nodes here are where A is in JP. And you have around order of P uh, cubed of these. And then you have order of P squared of these uh, abelian surfaces that are decomposable. And so as you can see, um, the, these A in EP, the blue nodes are quite rare. So you don't expect to hit them very often. Um, and you can sort of exploit this, uh, this uh, subgraph to construct an attack against the isogeny problem. So I like to view this attack as sort of a general, not generalization of del Scalbraith, but it's a similar idea where in del Scalbraith, um, what you do is you try to find the FP subgraph of your uh, super singular isogeny graph. And for this attack, what you do is you walk around in the graph until you hit one of these rare nodes. And then the problem in EP is a lot easier. So yeah, so this attack is due to Costello and Smith. And what you do is you have a start and end node. Um, the first step is to walk around in your isogeny graph until um, you hit one of these nodes in EP. Um, and because of sort of the proportion of the nodes in the graph where you have order of P cubed nodes, white nodes and order P squared blue nodes. 
you would expect to complete this in sort of O till P time. And then your second step, once you found uh, these paths, is to construct a path in this sort of subgraph, where now you find the, the path between these two nodes. And why is this easier? Well, you can, what you can do is actually just consider each of the elliptic curves separately. So you can find a path in, from E1 to E1 prime, find a path from E2 and E2 prime. And if the length of these paths are congruent mod two, um, you can find a product path. You can sort of like patch it up to find a product path from E1 times E2 to E1 prime times E2 prime. And uh, finding these paths, you can use an algorithm like Del Scalbraith algorithm. And so it can be done in O till square root of P time. And so the, the cost of the algorithm is really dominated by the first step of finding paths from abelian surfaces in JP to abelian surfaces in EP. And a way that you can rephrase this is finding an abelian surface, which is NN split for some N. So what does NN split mean? Well, you say that a, a Jacobian of a genus two curve is NN split if there is some isogeny from your Jacobian to a product of elliptic curves. So you can, in a sense, rephrase the first step of this algorithm as walking in the graph until you find such a splitting. So yeah, because this is the bottleneck of the attack, uh, we kind of focus on the first step. Um, okay, so now let's go into more depth of how the first step is actually done. So using two to isogenies, so Richelieu isogenies, um, because these are the easiest to compute and the most efficient, um, the attack will take walks in your two to isogeny graph, and it will walk until you find a, uh, until you find a product of elliptic curves. Um, so you start on some node A0. You take a step using a Richelieu isogeny. Um, from the Richelieu isogeny formula, you have sort of when you're computing it, you have you have to compute the determinant of some matrix. And if this determinant is zero, it tells you precisely that um, A1 uh, is a product of elliptic curves. So from the isogeny formula, you can actually detect whether A1 is split. And if not, then you just take another step. And you sort of repeat this until eventually you do find some AI lying in EP. Um, so the question that we asked was uh, taking steps in the 2-2 isogeny graph, again, because Richelieu isogenies are just a lot more efficient than any others. Um, can we detect uh, whether some node, the current node that we're on, is NN split, where now we want to consider N bigger than 2? And if you could do that, in a sense, at each step, you can scan a greater proportion of the graph for um, products of elliptic curves. So the sort of naive answer or the naive way that you can do it is just simply compute all NN isogenies from AI uh, for N bigger than two, but this really is not efficient. Um, and uh, we want to be able, in a sense, to scan for all possible splittings in one go rather than computing an isogeny, seeing if it's split, computing another one and seeing if it's split. Um, so is there a way that we can make the detection more efficient? And if so, you could hope that you can uh, improve the concrete complexity of Costello-Smith, the attack, um, in the same way maybe that the super solver paper improves on the del Scalbraith algorithm. Okay, so now how do we detect NN splittings? So this is actually answered by some, um, by moduli spaces and by work being done in, in moduli spaces. So you have, so a moduli space is just a geometric object that parameterizes algebraic objects. Um, 
in a very uh, informal way. And um, so up here we have this LN, and this is the moduli space or it parameterizes genus two curves that have some NN split Jacobian. And we consider this up to FP bar isomorphism. So we just quotient out by, by FP, FP bar isomorphism. And then down here, we just have M2, which is the moduli space of genus two curves. So it parameterizes genus two curves up to FP bar isomorphism. And for n small, uh, this ln is actually birational uh, to A2. So it kind of looks like a plane. Um, and then down here, because of these Igusa clutch invariants, we can actually map a genus two curve to weighted projective space, where if you remember these weights two, four, six, and 10 were the subscripts on your Igusa clutch invariants. Okay. So for sort of abstract reasons, there is some, there exists some, for all n, there exists some map that takes um, this plane here down to M2. So there's a map from Ln to M2, and this exists for all n, um, but we don't actually, well, we don't have explicit formulae for them. And the image 5m, will live inside this, uh, will live inside M2 or this weighted projective space. So the question of is C NN split over FP bar can be answered by whether the class that C lives in is inside this image. So if C is inside this image, then it came from some point up here um, and some point up here is just a genus two curve that's NN split. And if your curve isn't split, then it won't have come from uh, this map. And so it lives outside the image. And here the bar, it just it represents like a very technical condition where you actually have to take the Zariski closure of your image. But for all intents and purposes, you can just remove the bar. Um, okay, and so the magical tool that we have due to Kumar is that Kumar actually explicitly computes this map for n smaller than or equal to 11. So what he does is he gives explicit polynomials in R and S that will map a point here down to a, a point here. And not only does he do that, but he, uh, Kumar in this paper um, actually also gives you, so if you have a curve C, you can compute the RNS that it came from. And Kumar also gives then a map from RNS to the pair of elliptic curves um, that it will split to. So what you know is there exists some isogeny that takes your Jacobian to these pairs of elliptic curves. Um, unfortunately, you can't, this doesn't actually give you the isogeny, but what you can then do is like a post computation where you compute and an isogeny from this Jacobian because you know that it, one of them will take you to a, a product of elliptic curves. Um, and you can do this using like AV isogenies or some package like that. Um, there's actually other work due to uh, Sam Frankly, one of the co-authors, and Tom Fisher, where they compute this map up here for n equals to 12, 15, and 17, I think. Um, but they look at this from a different viewpoint, and so they haven't actually computed this map down here. But it would be interesting for future work to actually get explicit formulae for this map for higher n. Um, Okay, so what we do, or what I'll now discuss, is how you can sort of find the RNS. Like given a C, you want to find this RNS, so then you can map it to the pair of elliptic curves. So we want to detect whether our curve C is in the image of this explicit map that Kumar gives us. Um, so 
the, meth the first method is, well, you can just compute the equation of the image. And then if your point C lies on it, um, it will evaluate to zero. Um, and so if you denote the Fn for the equation of the image um, of this map, then the Jacobian will be NN split if and only if F Fn evaluates to zero at these igusa Klebsch variants of C. So computing the image has been done for N uh, equals two up to five by Bruin, Dorickson, and Shaska in many uh, in a series of papers with many co-authors. Um, Shaska claims to have five in one of his papers, but we couldn't actually find it. So we did recompute five and like verify it. The problem with computing the image is that it's super big. <laughs> Fn is really, really large and it grows uh, like exponentially fast, the number of monomials. So evaluating this image is actually very inefficient. And to give you an idea of how bad this image is, I copied uh, the image for n equals three. So this might be a bit painful, but um, yeah, it's super big. And if you think this looks bad, then just think, here, the number of monomials is 300. And when you get to n equals five, you have around 43,000 monomials, um, where your degree is 480. So I think the file is something like, oh, I don't know how much, but it's like in the gigabytes of like how big this image is. And it took like weeks to compute even. Um, and so it seems you can probably compute n equals six but it seems kind of infeasible to get to n equals 11 um, or even like store it on a computer. I think when we tried to push the image for n equals five onto GitHub, GitHub was like, no, we don't want, <laughs> we don't want, uh, like don't store this on GitHub because it was just so big. Um, okay. So the other way you can do this is using elimination theory. Um, so to remove sort of projective issues, we will normalize our invariants and we choose this normalization because it sort of minimizes the degrees of your uh, resulting equations, which makes things a bit faster. But there are other normalizations you can choose. And then Kumar gives us this map by N and we will normalize it in the same way to give us I1, I2 and I3. Okay, so you can use elimination theory like Grobner basis to find, uh, to sort of solve this problem, but what that might be a bit slow. So what we do is we compute resultants. So what you wanna do is you set up sort of a system of equations, which says, well, if C lies on the image, then the invariance um, of C must satisfy this pair of equations, uh, this sort of triple of equations. And then if there exists a solution to the system of equations such that the denominator, because these are rational functions here. Um, so you also don't want the denominators to vanish at the solution. Then your Jacobian will be NN split. So you can determine if such an R zero and S zero exists by computing resultants of say F1, F2, F2 and F3, and you get a pair of resultants. Then you have to divide out by some factors that appear. Um, and these factors appear because they tell you, so what you do is you take the numerators of these Fi and you compute the resultants of the numerators. But when you compute these resultants, sort of extra factors pop up. And those extra factors are just telling you the points where the denominators vanish. Um, and so you divide out by those factors and then you compute a GCD. And if your GCD is degree zero, then the Jacobian is not split and otherwise it's split. So um, this method is a lot more efficient um, and it requires a lot less memory because these equations are really compact. But we actually do something slightly better, which we, instead of evaluating these um, 
alpha i, alpha, uh, sorry, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha three, we actually view them as variables and we can pre-compute the resultants generically and then what you, and divide out by these factors. So what you do at every step is you just evaluate the resultants at the invariance of your curve and then uh, you compute the GCD. And this requires a bit more memory, but it's a lot more efficient because computing resultants and dividing out by factors is quite costly. Okay, so how do we apply this to the attack? So the first step is you want to find determine a set of n uh, for which we're actually going to do this detection. And similarly to how we did it in like the super solver paper, what you do is you find the set of n between 2 and 11 that minimize the number of multiplications you do per node that you like reveal in the graph. And so for this example, I'm just going to take n equals 2, 3, and 5. Um, OK, so the first step is taking a step in the 2, 2 graph. Um, and then what you do is we are going to do the detection for n equals 2, 3, and 5 using the method before. So pre-computing resultants and then taking a GCD. So for n equals 2, you check 12, uh, 14 nodes. So the number of um, 2 to isogenies from uh, an abelian surface is 15, but you've walked from one of them. So you check 14 new nodes. If none of these are split, then you go to n equals 3. And here, you check 40 nodes. Um, I didn't actually color 40 things in, but um, I think it's just illustration purposes. And uh, then for n equals 5, you reveal 156 nodes. And then if none of these are split, then you take another step in your 2 to isogeny graph and repeat this until you eventually find a splitting. So as you can see, uh, the gray nodes here uh, highlight the, the extra nodes that we revealed using this uh, NN splitting detection. So if we hadn't have done this, all we would really check are these three nodes. But using the, this like detection method, we've actually revealed a much bigger proportion of the graph. So we have we implemented the Costello Smith uh, attack, um, and then we uh, so we did this implemented it without the detection, and then we implemented our NN splitting detection, and we ran a couple of experiments um, for primes with bit sizes fifty up to a thousand um, until they reach ten to the eight FP multiplications. And then we counted how, uh, how many FP multiplications per node that we revealed and the number of nodes that we sort of detected and stepped on in the graph in that set of FP multiplications. So here are some results. So for 50, um, the original attack uh reveals around 172,000 nodes um and we revealed around 2 million and so the multiplications per node revealed was a lot smaller an improvement factor of around 16 17 and then this increases as p gets bigger so for p equals a thousand which is a lot bigger than you'd use for cryptographic purposes um, but we actually get sort of an improvement factor of 160. Um, and the improvement gets larger as P gets bigger because um, what, uh, taking a step in the graph, uh, you have to do, you have to take a route. And so that sort of the cost of that depends on your prime P. However, our splitting detection, all you do is take resultants and GCDs. So the cost of that only depends on your n that you're using. And so as um, the prime gets bigger, taking a step gets more costly and our splitting stays at the same cost. 
So you actually improve a lot more for bigger primes. Okay, any questions? Thanks, Mario. Any question? Oh, a lot of them. Okay. Um. Hey, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, I do have one small, small question about the um, this map from the RS invariance to the pairhood of the curves that you mentioned. Uh, so you said that uh, Kumar has a formula to find these two curves, but he doesn't have a formula for the actual isogeny, right? Yeah. Is this something that is hard or did he just not bother writing it down because he didn't care? Uh, do you have any idea about doing this, finding the formula? Uh, yeah, so I think maybe the purpose why he didn't do it was he didn't need it. Um, uh, honestly, I, I'm not super sure how how hard it would be to recover the isogeny from this. I think probably harder than just computing all the NN isogenies, especially for the end that you actually have this map for. But yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how hard it would be to recover the isogeny from from this map. I think you only you only get that there exists one. And then because he actually does this, this map and everything over Q. Uh, not over a finite field. So I don't know how hard it would be in that case. Yeah. I think he asked us. Uh, hey, uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, have you read Martin Djukanovic PhD thesis? No. Um, it's just that he does something very similar in chapter one where he uh, uses resultants to actually compute and end splittings. It's a slightly different setting. Uh, he doesn't really give concrete examples. I think he only did up to n equals five or six. He gives a more general approach, I feel, which uses Grubner basis computations. Um, so I was, I'm, I have the impression that this can be translated to that. Um, so I'm not sure. Well, the question was, have you looked into that really? Uh, no, I think our starting point was this paper by Kumar that okay. like computes up to sorry up to eleven. Um, this was sort of like our way in to the problem, and then I mean going from this to like the resultant computation is uh, I don't know. I feel like it's quite like a natural like detecting computing RNS. Um, from the C, it's sort of a natural way to do it is setting up this system of equations and then how do you solve it? Well, using resultants. I think we try like Grobner basis approach, but it was really slow, so. Uh, yeah, it's, I think it scales with N at least. So uh, yeah, that's probably not gonna be very efficient for larger N. Yeah, I think the the cool thing, at least about the resultants, is you can like do the pre-computation, which actually saves you a lot of. Uh, yeah, uh, that that was the main reason why yeah. I put the link because he actually also uses that and then has like a post, uh, a computation of a uh, Rubner basis of degree, uh, well in this case n. Uh, okay, thank okay. you. Well, I'll have a look. Thank you for that. Hi, uh, thanks. Really nice talk. Um, when you've got this map like from from the rs plane into into p2 there and you're just using like the collection invariance or reducer invariance there or that's that's your space um have you tried using and, and this is really like not general anymore but you know you're going to be walking around the two two graphs so everyone's got all this uh two torsion everywhere and so you can use like more special forms of the genus two curve, like um, Rosenhain variants or something where, you know, like there's it's odd degree and then zero and one for the first coefficients. And if you do that, uh, at least if you look at the invariance of those curves, the degree comes down a lot and that using that sort of extra structure might bring down the degree of some of the things you're doing later or uh, reduce the complexity of some of the polynomials. Um, I don't know if you've been looking at using that extra structure or if that's sort of 
off the table? Uh, yeah, I think we kind of approached it more like generally so that you can, mm -hmm. the attacking the problem um, works for like any genus too, uh, any pair of surfaces. Um, but yeah, the, the thing with the invariants, we did try and look into using other invariants, but um, yeah, we didn't consider it in the special setting, mm -hmm. but maybe, I definitely think even the computation of like the Richelieu isogenies, if you assume that you have like two torsion, you can use like Sabrina's uh, mm -hmm. uh, formulae rather than doing it generically. So you can improve the efficiency as well on that. But uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. I, we haven't looked into it. It's it's definitely really interesting in full generality anyway. So it's uh, yeah. it's good to have the general result. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. I have one more question. Um, can you go to the last slide, perhaps? Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. uh, all of a sudden, you started using composites, and have you played around like what the difference is uh, between using prime n or composite n? Because from a splitting perspective they sort of have to pass a jacobian first already no i mean like if n is six then uh, then you could have tried if one of the two two is his neighbors three three splits as well right yeah so so how we actually uh so yeah the cost function is a little more complicated for these like uh composites because you have to take into account that if you have like a three and a six in your set, you're actually double counting how many you reveal. Um, so it, it is a bit more complicated in the composite set uh, setting, but we um, like the, the splittings we are detecting are like optimal splittings. And so this means that it doesn't factor. So like if you, this six, six splitting, if you detect a six, six splitting, um, it's, we're detecting like optimal splitting so it couldn't have come from like a like a, a factor of the six if, if that makes sense okay thank you i've got well it's not a question it's a remark i just want to um advertise enrique florit's work a bit um so you've got this hypothesis that it's a ramanujan this graph and it's definitely not um but it's got good expansion properties uh, all the same so it's it's like not ideal but it's it's pretty good um and with uh, with eric uh, with enric i mean he did a lot of computations we've got a lot of data on this and we're trying to work out the the constants uh, so um maybe you can define it differently to to make it ramanujan but it's not like a, what we have in the in the usual sense uh yeah. yeah i mean with craig we had this hypothesis and it's uh it's not quite true uh it's not misleading either but um uh yeah there's there's been a fair bit of experimental work on this and some there's interesting theoretical questions as well but uh if you google um enric florit uh you'll find cool stuff that he's done thank you Thanks. Thanks also for your uh, nice talk. Um, yeah, I had a small question. So in cryptographic applications or the ones I have in mind, you often want to find not just any chain of two to isogenies, but you really want to find a chain that concatenates to a two to the n two to the n isogeny. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a way to control that somehow in your approach? Um. So like the the whole uh, the whole isogeny will be like a two to the n i two to the n two to the n isogeny. Yes. Yeah, I mean with with this method, you will probably likely have like a four four isogeny at the end or a six six. So I'm not. Well, if you have four four, it's fine. But if it's like a six six, then you have this like three three isogeny. I'm no, not. Even in the, yeah, sorry. Even in the case of a four four, you could like have that the uh, the 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 all over kernel is not z mod two to the n times z mod two to the n but it could be it could have more components so uh is there a way to exclude that so you said 
uh, you have one incoming isogeny, so you have 14 outgoings, yeah, yeah. but actually you only have like, uh, like eight some good eight ones. good ones. Yes. Yeah. I, I, how you can control it is if it's a bad extension, you disregard it and continue your, your path walking in the, in the graph and continue this. That would be the only way I would know how to control it. Um, but if you find like a six, six splitting, then you're not gonna, I don't know any way to sort of, yeah, I'm not sure how, how I would control it. Um, yeah, maybe it's just a general question. If you find any isogeny, can you then find? Like one of a specific One of degree. a specific kind or so, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think um, like in genus one, the path finding and the, like the isogeny problem are very, I mean, they're the same because you can sort of convert this isogeny into the, any degree you want. In the genus two setting, um, I think there is a bit of a distinction between finding paths and finding an isogeny of like a specific degree, um, at least for now. But. Okay, thanks. So we have one minute left. One minute question. Okay. I hope you will finish your question before the time ends. Um, yeah, so Damia also asks a question in oh. the chat. Um, do you sometimes find nodes that are both split for, let's say, three and five, so for different n? I mean, the way our algorithm works is when we find one, we terminate. So we haven't actually ran into such an example, but I I think it would be possible, but probably very rare. I mean, it's already really rare to find one splitting. I think it would be very rare mm -hmm. to find two. Yeah, you could you could test that. Like you if if such a thing exists, you can run this and see if it does split for two, uh for like n equals three or n equals five. Uh we haven't actually run into any example where that happens, but okay. So thanks everyone. Let's thank Maria again.